Hello there and welcome to the lecture for antibiotics in antimicrobial drugs. Uh, today we will be talking about medications and anti antibiotics in general. Uh, in order to go through this chapter, just a few key terms we want to cover first. So chemotherapy is the use of drugs to treat a disease. Uh, that is everything from what we traditionally think of as chemotherapies and some kind of cancer treatment. Um, all the way to taking aspirin for a headache. So any kind of chemical therapy is considered a chemotherapy. Antimicrobial drugs are a specific class of chemotherapy that are used to fight off bacterial infections. They can interfere with the growth of a microorganism within a host. They can actually directly or indirectly kill uh, microorganisms as well. An antibiotic is a substance that is naturally produced by a microorganism Whereas an antimicrobial drug is something usually that's more man-made, uh, but an antibiotic is actually produced by microorganisms themselves, usually in very small amounts in order to inhibit a different microorganism. Remember in the, um, when we were talking about immunology, we talk about our normal flora, our normal flora are antagonistic. Uh, they sometimes produce antimicrobial compounds to try and prevent other microorganisms. Well, sometimes we can use those um, as antibiotics. Then we have the concept of selective toxicity. And selective toxicity is when a drug is responsible for killing a microorganism that we might find harmful or pathogenic, but it does not damage the host. So many microorganisms have multiple targets. For instance, uh, we could target the cell wall of microorganisms, target the breakdown of peptidoglycan. Well, only the microorganism or the bacteria have peptidoglycan. They're the only ones with the cell wall. Uh, our body, we our, our cells don't have cell walls. So if we target chemotherapy, I'm, I'm sorry, if we target uh, peptidoglycan um, as a form of chemotherapy, then what we are doing is we, we are being very selective about what we are toxic against. So selective toxicity is one that's going to kill the bacteria or inhibit its growth to have some kind of effect on the microorganism, but not have an effect on the actual host tissue itself. Okay. So uh, microorganisms or bacteria in general are much easier to target because they do have multiple compounds or structures that are not found in human cells or in mammalian cells. The more complex the organisms get when we start moving into um, uh, parasites and even fungi, sometimes those organisms can be much more difficult to come up with medications against because the number of targets they have for selective toxicity are much fewer. Uh, we all know the first antibiotic uh, that was discovered was penicillin. It was discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. He was doing some research and some of his, uh, he was researching Staph aureus and one of his, a couple of his plates apparently had gotten uh, contaminated with penicillium fungi. Uh, notably, it's called penicillium notatum. And it was, he noticed that surrounding it, if you look at the bottom picture on the right, that surrounding the penicillium growth uh, is a zone of inhibition, like we saw in lab in our antibiotic resistance plates. And that zone of inhibition is where the penicillium fungus is giving off a compound we now know as, we now know as penicillin, uh, that was inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. And so Fleming wasn't really sure what to do with this discovery, but he did publish it and, and um, it, it was uh, documented. So a couple of years later, Florian Chain came up with the idea of using this penicillin compound of trying to extract it from uh, penicillium fungus and use it as a form of antibiotic or treatment, form of antimicrobial chemotherapy for patients uh, from World War, uh, World War II. So it was used for soldiers to prevent infection from injuries. Now, there are three primary sources of antibiotics. Uh, we get them from actinomycetes. Actinomycetes are a class of bacteria that are soil-dwelling bacteria. They can be uh, anaerobic or aerobic, and they are actually what gives soil its smell. If you ever, like, you know, we're playing outside or digging up something up, um, actinomycetes are the bacteria that give soil its its odor. Uh, fungi, we know penicillium, of course, produces penicillin. There's a few other fungus that produce um, antibiotics. And then we have some bacteria, and the most common bacteria to produce antibiotics is the Bacillus subtilis. Uh, 
uh, produces what's commonly known as bacitracin. Uh, you can see on the right there's a, a list of different microorganisms, some examples um, of microorganisms that produce the antibiotics. Now when we talk about antibiotics, we have to talk about spectrum because not all antibiotics are created equal, just as not all microorganisms are created equal. In this case, uh, the spectrum uh, that is affected by a particular antibiotic or antimicrobial compound is, very, is dependent on its mechanism of action. I used the example earlier uh, in selective toxicity of targeting peptidoglycan. Well, uh, penicillin is a narrow spectrum antibiotic it is only effective against gram-positive organisms, and that is because it uh, um, uh, penicillin interrupts or disrupts the tichoic acids that hold together the cell walls in penicillin. Well, only gram-positive organisms produce tichoic acids, so the selective toxicity is effective in terms of destroying Staph aureus or gram-positive organisms. It works very well in inhibiting their growth and division. However, it also at the same time causes that drug to be much more narrow spectrum because only uh, because the gram negatives don't have a lot of peptidoglycan and they can actually survive without a cell wall if they need to. Now you can notice on this table here there are some ranges and the more complicated when we get into the eukaryotic microorganisms you can see the ranges or spectrum of the drugs start to get much smaller. This is because the targets are much more specific. Uh, streptomycin is a pretty, uh, pretty good, probably medium spectrum. Tetracycline is a very broad spectrum antibiotic. It works very well. Uh, and then you have down at the bottom left there, isonazid is extremely is the exact opposite. It's extremely narrow spectrum, and it only actually works against mycobacteria. It is specific to mycolic acid. Now when we talk about the mechanism of action, an MOA is how something works. What does this drug do to the actual microorganism that either one, inhibits its growth, or two, directly destroys the bacteria itself? Um, we know broad spectrum, these are antibiotics that of course affect a large range of bacteria. And then we have narrow spectrum antibiotics which are going to affect a very narrow spectrum of bacteria. All right, um, continuing on our slide here, we have what's known as a super infection. Now, I included this here because anti even though we're talking about mechanisms of action, a super infection uh, is the result of the, of the spectrum of the antibiotic that you may be giving. For example, uh, normal flora will sometimes overgrow because they are not targeted. Um, or some bacteria that's not targeted may overgrow because of the death of another organism that was affected by the drug. So we get overgrowth of one organism, like uh, Clostridium difficile, against normal flora that were destroyed. They, even though they were non-targeted, it was a broad-spectrum antibiotic, so it kills the gut flora, allowing the Clostridium difficile to then thrive and start causing infection producing toxins. So super infections are oftentimes the result of bacteria that are either resistant, we see that with resistance quite a bit, or non-targeted bacteria that are causing, causing a secondary infection. Um, then we have the two types of uh, antimicrobial compounds. We have bactericidal, which will actually directly kill the microorganism, and then we have bacteria static, which prevents the bacteria from growing. So the population will not increase, and this will allow the immune system to be able to kind of get a hold of it and get, get control over the infection and prevent it from getting any worse, and hopefully send somebody from an acute phase infection to um, a more of a convalescent stage. How do these drugs, what are some effects when uh, some of these medications are given in combination? So when we have drugs that are given in combination. Now this doesn't just mean two antibiotics together or um, something like that. It, this can be if somebody's receiving an antibiotic, but that antibiotic interacts with the medication that person may already be on. So we have synergism. In synergism, the effect of two drugs together is going to be greater than the effect of either of them alone. 
This does happen with some combinations of antibiotics. Uh, there's actually a, um, a brand name antibiotic called Synersid, which is a combination of three antibiotics together that all work really well in combination against MRSA. Uh, but individually, none of those bacteria are actually effective enough. All right, then we have antagonism. With antagonism, two drugs being given together are less effective than either one of them if they're given individually or alone. Uh, in this case, we could use the example of uh, birth control and antibiotics. If a woman is on, on birth control and she has to take antibiotics for something, some antibiotics can actually neutralize her birth control and cause the, if she's on the pill, and the birth control can actually be less effective and she is at a higher, has a higher chance of becoming pregnant while on those uh, antibiotics. Then we have contraindicative, and contraindicative simply means that you cannot, under any circumstances, give these two drugs together, because if you do, you could likely kill your patient. Um, it is usually very harmful to someone uh, to give it, it's actually detrimental to the person. And the classic example of contraindicative is Viagra and beta blockers. So men who are on beta blockers for heart conditions, Viagra is contraindicative. You cannot take Viagra if, you, um, if you're on uh, beta blockers. It can cause the patient to go into severe shock and eventually cardiac arrest. So this is just a photograph. That's an example of uh, some synergy. There is synergy occurring. You notice in the white dotted lines, we have the uh, zones of inhibition. And you can see between the two uh, antibiotic discs, amoxicillin and astreonam, that uh, there's a much larger zone of it inhibition. And that is because these two drugs are uh, synergistic with each other. So the two of them given in combination are actually more effective than either one of them given individually. Now we ran this, this is a Kirby Bauer test, and we did run this Kirby Bauer test in lab. You're used to seeing a zone of inhibition. But nowadays, um, when uh, commercial labs and clinical laboratories are testing antibiotics, particularly by hand, they run a test called an e-test. Now this is an e-test, and an e-test is where we have the actual concentration gradient shown on these strips. So each strip is laid down, it has a different antibiotic on it, and because it's in this long strip like this, you can see instead of our zone of inhibition being perfectly round, it's more teardrop shaped. And that's because at the top of the strip, here in this trimethoprim strip, you can see at the top, it has a concentration of 256 units per uh, microliter. So you can, where we have such a high concentration, of course, the zone of inhibition is going to be much greater. As you move down the strip, you'll see the concentrations of uh, micrograms of antibiotic per ml or uh, per unit get smaller and smaller and smaller, and the zone of inhibition gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Till we get down to, on the trimethoprim there, it's like a 0.064. So less than uh, one-tenth of a microgram of this antibiotic can actually inhibit the growth of whatever bacteria is on this plate. That concentration is known as the MIC, or M-I-C. And an M-I-C stands for Minimum Inhibitory Concentration. What is the lowest concentration of antibiotic that can be present and still inhibit the growth of that bacteria? Now the reason an MIC is really important is because that is the minimum concentration of antibiotic that we have to maintain in a patient's body in order for, in a patient's system, in order for that antibiotic to be effective. And understanding how the MIC is accomplished is what pharmaceutical companies do when they are calculating dosages or how many milligrams of an antibiotic a patient has to take uh, per body weight. Per, per kilogram or uh, um, according to their body weight. So somebody who weighs 100 pounds doesn't have to take as much as strong of an antibiotic or I should say as much as high a concentration of antibiotic as somebody who weighs 250 pounds. And this is why dosages are really important, particularly in antibiotics. This is also why antibiotics are given on an hourly rate instead of just twice a day. So antibiotics oftentimes are prescribed, uh, take, you know, 
100 milligrams every eight hours. That's because in addition to body weight, you have to consider the metabolism of the drug itself. So even though they may be taking a high enough concentration, if they take it sporadically and not on time in a timely manner, we're talking about the patients here, then oftentimes that, that minimum, in the, the concentration of the anti antibiotic can fall below the minimum inhibitory concentration. And if it falls below that, then we still have exposure. You can see at the very bottom of that strip, the bacteria are, become, are now resistant at such low concentrations. If we constantly expose the bacteria to those low concentrations, eventually they're going to become resistant enough to even higher concentrations. And the MIC is no longer going to be effective and we'll have to maintain an even higher concentration. Say we might have to go to 0.125 from the 0.064. So minimum inhibitory concentration plays a really big role in determining dosages and timing of different antibiotics. So how do these antimicrobial drugs work? This is that mechanism of action we were talking about before. And the mechanism of action determines whether or not this antibiotic is going to be bactericidal or bacteriostatic. So here we have a picture of a bacteria, and in the yellow boxes we have different mechanisms of action and some examples of antibiotics that fall in that classification. So some, my, some um, antimicrobial compounds will affect cell wall synthesis. These are your penicillins, vancomycin, um, facetracin, cephalosporins, those antibiotics um, can inhibit the synthesis of cell walls. They can also actually sometimes uh, inhibit other proteins within the cell wall, not just uh, incorporation of peptidoglycan. Then we have inhibitors of protein synthesis, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, uh, some of the streptomycins, a lot of the actinomyces microorganisms work by inhibiting protein synthesis. If they stop protein synthesis, usually by tying up the, um, uh, uh, they're going to type the ribosome. So they'll inhibit the ribosome. If they inhibit the ribosome, then they're going to inhibit all protein synthesis. This is going to be bactericidal. It's going to cause the cell to die because none of its proteins are going to be usable. Sometimes they'll affect um, inhibition of nucleic acid. Um, I think one of the antibiotics that uh, some people studied was uh, rifamycin or rifampin. And rifamycin inhibits DNA gyrase, which uh, can, or the topoisomerases, and it causes DNA replication to not be able to continue and the DNA breaks. Uh, then we have inhibition of synthesis of specific uh, 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 metabolites or proteins, I should say enzymes involved in metabolism. Uh, depending on what enzyme is targeted, will determine whether or not that antimicrobial compound will be bacteriostatic or bactericidal. Others can injure the plasma membrane. This is the um, fifth uh, MOA. And injury to plasma membrane is usually bactericidal. So that brings us to some of the classes of the um, different antibiotics that we've talked about so far. So. I'm going to go through a couple of the most important ones, and we'll talk a little bit about antivirals and uh, antifungals uh, anti, uh, and some uh, parasitic drugs, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all the different classes. You have a copy of this PowerPoint and a list of all of the different classes, and that's just information to look up. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some resistance, and then that way we can keep this lecture pretty short. All right, so inhibitors of cell wall synthesis include your penicillins. And penicillins is a huge class of drugs, right? Over 50 different antibiotics fall under the class of penicillins. Now, there are natural penicillins and semi-synthetic penicillins, and there's an important con difference between the two. Natural penicillins are those that are directly derived from the actual penicillium fungus itself. And in the natural penicillins, some of them are no longer on the market, and that is because so much resistance has developed against those penicillins. But I want you to look at the picture on the right, where we have the, the pinkish purple box there. Inside of it, you see a structure that's labeled the beta-lactam ring. Beta-lactam is, is the structure you see there, and this is referred to as the common nucleus. And you can see the first two penicillins, there's penicillin G and penicillin V. And the purple box is identical structurally between the two. But on the left, the little R groups that are attached um, are a little bit different 
one penicillin V has an oxygen, whereas penicillin G does not. That is a structural difference between the two. Now, that beta-lactam ring is a target, and that is a target for an enzyme called a beta-lactamase, or a penicillinase. And beta-lactamases are enzymes that will break or they'll attach to the penicillin molecule and break the molecule in half at the beta-lactam ring. That's the structure that it, this enzyme will cut and break. If it breaks the penicillin molecule in half, then the penicillin is no longer functional. So many microorganisms that have become penicillin resistant have done so by evolving the ability or developing, getting the ability through either conjugation, uh, they could get it through viral transfer, but they pick up the ability to produce these beta-lactamase enzymes and that will cause the penicillin to now be non-functional. It doesn't work at all. Now, in order to kind of fight this, what some pharmaceutical companies have done is they have developed semi-synthetic penicillins. Remember back in Unit 2 when we talked about enzymes, enzymes and their substrates are very specific. They're a lock and key mechanism. So what these pharma pharmaceutical companies did is they went in and they took penicillin, which would be the key to the beta-lactamase enzymes lock, and they changed the key. So you can see this oxacillin and ampicillin, you can see they just added a little structure to it, or they just tweaked that R group structure, that part that's attached to the purple box. They just changed that structure just enough so that the, the active site of the beta-lactamase enzyme will no longer be able to bind to the penicillin class molecule. In this case, although the organism could, let's say, be uh, resistant to penicillin G, it is not resistant to ampicillin or oxacillin because they are structurally different enough that the enzyme is no longer functional. Cephalosporins also have a beta-lactam ring, uh, and they also, some organisms are, if they're resistant to penicillin, a lot of times they may be resistant to cephalosporins, so they also have it. But cephalosporins, instead of being named oxacillins or ampicillins, different names, they are actually given generations. So cephalosporins are a much broader, have a much broader spectrum than penicillin. Um, they are also inhibitors of cell wall synthesis, uh, but they come in generations. So some bacteria may be resistant to the first generation cephalosporin, so instead we give them a fourth generation cephalosporin. So there are multiple generations of cephalosporins. The latest generation is not necessarily better, uh, it's just different. So some organisms that have become resistant to earlier generations are now susceptible to later ones and vice versa. Uh, some other inhibitors of cell wall synthesis include the bacitracins, vancomycins. Uh, these are your polypeptides. Um, I'll let you guys uh, look at those. Then we have the uh, other inhibitors of cell wall synthesis are the very narrow, super narrow spectrum that are against mycobacterium, uh, mycobacterium in particular, tuberculosis. So uh, isonazid, also known as INH, and ethambutol are both extremely narrow spectrum and given usually in combination with other drugs against tuberculosis. Then we get inhibitors of protein synthesis. This includes chloramphenicol and aminoglyc uh, aminoglycosides. Uh, chloramphenicol is very broad spectrum, but you can't give it in high doses and uh, can't be given for really long periods of time. It can suppress activity of bone marrow, which ultimately will result in immunosuppression. Uh, aminoglycosides are pretty broad spectrum and they alter the 30S subunit of the ribosome. So we have chloramphenicol, that disrupts the, the 50S subunit of a ribosome, and the aminoglycosides, they uh, change the shape of the 30S. Other inhibitors of protein synthesis, we have the tetracyclines and uh, structogramins. Structogramins, this is that synercid I was telling you about earlier. Uh, tetracyclines are really uh, uh, very common. Tetracyclines are really inexpensive. They're super cheap. Uh, to make. They also, the, the tetracycline molecule is really small in comparison to other drug molecules, so it has a really good penetration into deep tissue. Uh, 
Uh, one of the problems, however, is tetracycline is extremely broad spectrum. It kills lots of different things, and it can be toxic in long-term and high-level doses. Up there in the top right, the graying or browning of teeth like that is from long-term tetracycline use. Sometimes you see it in children from really poor areas because tetracycline is so cheap. It's one of the number one and very effective in broad spectrum. It's one of the number one antibiotics that is donated by most pharmaceutical companies to, to uh, parts of the world that uh, need medication and can't afford it. Um, but it, it, is, it can be toxic. So that graying of the teeth, you'll see that in really young children from, uh, from poorer areas. Uh, and you'll also see it in geriatric patients because they oftentimes are on tetracycline for a long period of time. The macrolides and linezolid, uh, uh, both of these are, uh, the macrolides are your erythromycin. You can see, look at the size of that um, erythromycin molecule. It's quite large. Uh, it's a, a narrow spectrum antibiotic. It's used in some instances, more severe diseases, Legionnaire's disease uh, and pneumonia. Uh, linezolid is effective against the gram positives and it is effective against most MRSAs. There's a version of it called Zyvox. Then we have injury to plasma membrane. Polymyxin B is one of the components in neosporin and other topical triple antibiotic ointments. They mix it with bacitracin and neomycin uh, in topical applications. Then we have the rifamycin. Rifamycin, that's my favorite, uh, or rifampin, inhibits uh, synthesis of RNA. It also is structurally related to other macrolides. Uh, and rif um, rifampin in particular not only inhibits RNA but can also tie up, um, can prevent DNA replication through uh, affecting topoisomerases, DNA gyrase in particular. It's used as an anti-tuberculum drug, but it has this really weird uh, uh, side effect. One of the metabolites of the drug is an orange molecule, and it can actually cause skin and tendons to become like yellow or orange and it binds to the uh, keratin and collagen type proteins. So this picture on the right is a foot surgery. This is actually from a podiatrist and they opened up some, they're doing surgery on a foot. And when they opened up the foot, normally the tendon is supposed to be nice and creamy white, like you see on the right, but this tendon was kind of yellowish. And after a complete, it was, the tendon was, was healthy. It just was off color. So after uh, the surgery, they went through the patient history and found out that the patient the year before had been on rifamycin for an extended period of time. And their skin didn't really turn orange, but their tendons did and remained that way, well, that yellow color. Uh, quinolones, that's your Cipro, which is used against anthrax, uh, inhibits DNA gyrase as well. And it's also given in urinary tract infections, quite effective. Sulfa drugs are inhibitors. They are competitive inhibitors. You've seen this picture before down here, right? So uh, sulfa drugs will compete for the, um, uh, for one of, they compete with one of the nucleotides in DNA replication. They inhibit the synthesis of a compound known as PABA. Uh, and PABA is used in DNA and RNA synthesis, so they can inhibit uh, replication. This is a very broad spectrum drug and it is man-made. It is synthetic. Actually, sulfa drugs were the first synthetic, uh, totally synthetic antimicrobial compound uh, given as a chemotherapy. That brings us to the antifungals. Uh, antifungals, there's a couple of different mechanisms. Uh, the first mechanism we're going to look at is inhibition of ergosterol. Ergosterol is found in the plasma membrane of fungal, uh, fungal cells. So fungal cells have both a cell wall and a cell membrane. Their cell wall is made out of a protein called chitin, which is very, is, is the same protein that's used in the exoskeleton of insects, but their cell, their plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. And in our plasma membrane, we use a sterol known as cholesterol to help give structure and stability to our plasma membrane. Fungi, instead of using cholesterol, use ergosterol. So ergosterol is a really common, um, uh, it's a common target for selective toxicity in uh, fungus. Uh, 
So we have the polyenes, azoles, allylamines. Uh, the polyenes uh, are amphotericin B. They're used in systemic fungal infections, usually in pill form or through injection. If they're uh, given through IV, they are administered with fats, with lipids to help buffer the, buffer the drug to the uh, kidneys because they can be toxic to the kidneys. Uh, particularly in the geriatric community, people who have like nail fungus or something like that, many times they'll give them some type of uh, amphotericin for a, to prevent any kind of systemic. But if they're over the age of 65, many doctors won't do it because it is so toxic to the kidneys. And the kidneys do wear down um, as you age. The azoles are uh, used in athlete's foot treatment. Some of the yeast infection creams given to women for vaginal yeast infections. Um, they are used in topicals. Allylamines are used when there's resistance to azoles. So the azoles aren't working, they'll go to a stronger drug like the allylamine. Other inhibitors of the cell wall are echinocandins. Uh, Cancetus is one that's used against candidus infections in women. Uh, and of course, pneumocystis is a fungal pneumonia uh, in HIV or late stage HIV. Uh, it works well against uh, aspergillus, and it's used a lot of times in people who are immunocompromised. Flucinosine and pentamidine isothionate. Uh, flucytosine is an analog to the uh, uh, to the nucleotide cy uh, cytosine, and it interferes with the synthesis of RNA. So it kind of acts as a, 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 a mimic of cytosine, and then when it gets incorporated into the RNA molecule, it doesn't it doesn't pair properly and it causes uh, disruption in the actual synthesis of RNA. Pentamidine isothionate is an anti-pneumocystis drug and it's believed to attach to DNA. Um, it has selective toxicity because uh, fungi can uh, metabolize flucytosine and we do not. So it just kind of is inert. We just pee it out. Other antifungals will inhibit microtubules in mitosis. Now remember, fungi are eukaryotic organisms, so they do use the property or the um, mechanism of uh, mitosis. Gracia fulvin is used for uh, ringworm, which is actually a fungal infection, not a uh, helminthic infection. Uh, it binds to the keratin and skin and prevents microtubules from forming so that the organism cannot spread. Uh, ringworm is caused by a... Uh, uh, fungus. Tolnaftate and pentamidine, both of these don't know how they work. Their mechanism of action is not fully understood, but they do know that they work well, and they are some of the uh, latest topicals used for athlete's foot and other skin, uh, skin infections. They're topicals. Antiviral drugs. Uh, there are not a whole lot of antiviral drugs out there, mainly because uh, viruses are really difficult to target. They're hard to target because there's not a lot of targets there. They are basically just genetic information. Uh, they're DNA or RNA and a protein coat and maybe an envelope if you're lucky. So there's not a whole lot there to target, which limits uh, some of the ability. Not to mention that in order to replicate, remember, these guys use the hosts, the host machinery. So if you target the host machinery, then you're not using selective toxicity and Many antivirals oftentimes have some, some nasty side effects. Uh, most antivirals are very uh, limited in their use. Uh, uh, the host can be harmed by the drug as well as the virus itself. Most of them uh, will be an analog of either DNA or RNA in its viral form. An analog is one, that was pretending, it's one that's pretending to be something else. So here we have uh, a, what we call a nucleoside or nucleotide analog. Uh, deoxyguanosine is the G in A, T, C, and G, right? Guanine. And when it's in its structurally intact form, it's called deoxyguanosine. And deoxyguanosine is faked out or replaced by the drug acyclovir. So when in the HIV mechanism, when HIV is trying to replicate rapidly and uh, create new viruses, instead of incorporating guanine into its RNA material, it actually incorporates acyclovir. And you can see structurally that acyclovir is different. And because it does not have that deoxyribose sugar, like our, our, um, like our nucleotide does, it does not fit properly. And we end up inhibiting 
or preventing DNA or RNA replication. Here are some other nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. Um, and this is just another diagram showing you, think of um, competitive inhibitors, uh, same way. So when DNA polymerase is trying to build a new DNA strand, the drug ends up getting incorporated instead of the actual true nucleotide and it causes the replication process to end because there's no, uh, there's no three prime carbon left for that incoming five prime kind of thing. So the, none of that is available. Uh, HIV is a virus, uh, the first virus that antiviral drugs were, were created for. So the very, AZT was actually one of the very first antivirals ever introduced. Uh, so HIV has a couple of different targets. HIV, when during replication, if you remember from previous units, has three enzymes it brings with it. It brings, of course, reverse transcriptase, which reverse transcribes its RNA into DNA. It also brings integrase. Integrase is the enzyme that it uses to integrate its genetic material into the cell's genetic, genetic material. And then it brings protease. And protease is an enzyme it uses to break down the host proteins and uh, turn around and activate the actual HIV, other HIV proteins to get everything started. Uh, integrases um, are oftentimes targets, so we can prevent the HIV virus from taking its reverse transcribed DNA and putting it into the host cell's genome. Uh, and proteases, which will prevent uh, activation of all of the other proteins in turn, preventing HIV from being able to replicate inside the cell. Fusion inhibitors, uh, because of the mechanism of entry for many different viruses, particularly those that are enveloped, uh, fusion inhibitors are used to prevent the virus from using fusion to be able to drop down into the cell. So fusion inhibitors are intended to prevent entry, whereas your um, enzyme targets are used to prevent integration or prevent a provirus. Enzyme inhibitors include the protease inhibitors, uh, attachment inhibitors, uncoding inhibitors, and of course, using interferons. So interferons are now becoming an antimicrobial agent because they help to uh, prevent the spread of viruses to new cells. We're gonna enhance the signal, particularly with viruses that may inhibit interferon production. Antiprotozoans, there are not a lot of antiprotozoan drugs on the market. Uh, primarily because protozoans are eukaryotic uh, organisms and they're very similar to our own cellular structure, making it very difficult to target them. The closer we get to mammalian cell structure, the harder it gets to target some of these things. And the antiprotozoans, most of them, they don't even really understand the mechanism of action or how it works. The one that's most common that you guys will probably hear the most about is flagell. Uh, flagell interferes with anaerobic metabolism. Uh, and causes damage to the DNA, and it's used against Giardia, which is pretty common in Florida, uh, Trichomonas, and Entamoeba. The chloroquines and the diiodine hydroxyquins are oftentimes used for amoebic infections, and uh, chloroquines used in uh, malaria. There is a lot of resistance by plasmodium to uh, this chloroquine, and they now use mefloquine, which um, is used when the malaria the patient has is resistant to traditional treatments, but it has to be administered very, very carefully because it can become, uh, it can cause some, some mental side effects or what they call psychiatric type side effects. Then we move on to the worms, anti-helminthic drugs. There are actually lots of wor dewormers on the market, uh, mainly because they're used mostly in the veterinary industry. And of course, dogs, cats, that sort of thing. Um, and, and there are a lot of humans, believe it or not, that are infected with uh, helminths. Nyclosamide prevents the generation of ATP, causes paralysis of tapeworms so that they can no longer maintain attachment and then they are shed in feces. Prazaquantel will alter the, the permeability of the membrane, allowing the um, immune system, the cytotoxic branch of the immune system, to be much more effective. It also causes paralysis of the worms, causing them to be passed in feces. Mabendazole and ivermectin. Mabendazole uh, sometimes is referred to as strongid. That's that yellow banana, banana smelling stuff they give your dog or cat 
when you go to the vet's office and your, your animal gets dewormed. Prevents the formation of microtubules and works best for roundworms found in the intestines. Then there's ivermectin. Ivermectin also is very effective against roundworms, intestinal roundworms, and it's probably a more common deworming method used in agriculture, but not so much in pets. Ivermectin is used more in cattle and horses, and it cannot be given to cats. It is toxic to felines. It will cause blindness. The complete mechanism of action of ivermectin is not completely known. Now, I want you to think a little bit about antibiotic resistance. Many microorganisms develop the ability to survive in high concentrations of many of these different um, uh, uh, antibiotics. And how they do it is really kind of interesting. So there's four common mechanisms or MOAs for antibiotic resistance. First is the bacteria just destroy the drug enzymatically. Think beta-lactamase. They just create an enzyme and they excrete this enzyme around them. They kind of surround themselves with it so that if they come into contact with that, uh, uh, with that drug, they can enzymatically destroy it before it ever even touches them, gets near them. They can prevent the drug from penetrating. So they kind of have like a capsule or some kind of coating that may prevent the drug from being able to penetrate across the cell membrane. They can alter the drug's target. So they may change the shape of a, a protein or an enzyme of their own that the uh, drug is targeting. And then there's rapid ejection of the drug. This is a process known as an efflux pump, E F L. E-F-F-L-U-X is how you spell it. Not influx, but efflux. And what these uh, bacteria are doing is they are rapidly ejecting the drug. As soon as the drug gains entry into the cell, they'll pump it right back out before it can come into contact with whatever target inside of the cell it, it is supposed to act upon. Uh, most of the time, the genes for resistance are found on plasmids, and um, they are also found within transposons for transposition, and they can oftentimes be transferred very easily from one bacteria to another, and this can be either of the same species or of different species. Antibiotic resistance is often due to a combination of multiple factors. Uh, resistance is becoming more and more prevalent. We're seeing more and more uh, of it. Uh, misuse of antibiotics is one of the number one reasons for the selection of resistance. So the misuse of antibiotics includes the following. Using old antibiotics. Oh, I have some left over from when I had a tooth infection last year, so I'll just use the rest of those instead of going to the doctor and getting a new prescription. This is one of the reasons that placed that many uh, pharmacies like Publix have made antibiotics free because they want to make them more accessible. It's not just about um, making them accessible for people who can't afford them, but it is also about preventing people from not getting them and using old ones or not using them or using someone else's. They're trying to prevent that and in preventing that they can help prevent development of resistance. So there's a, a whole lot of reasons that uh, some places do the, the uh, free antibiotics. Uh, using an antibiotic for something like a cold or a, a viral infection or worms or something like that. Antibiotics target by uh, bacteria. They do not target anything else. So taking um, an antibiotic for a cold or the flu is not going to help you. Uh, using antibiotics in animal feed. This has been such a problem that now in cattle there are only two antibiotics that are allowed to be used in feed and they are highly regulated. However, that has not occurred yet in the poultry industry and so chicken is full of lots of different antibiotics and their metabolites. Failing to complete the prescribed regimen. If you get a 10-day regimen, you should be taking your medication for 10 days. Uh, and of course, using somebody's leftover prescription. You don't necessarily know if your bacteria is the same bacteria, so it may be the wrong spectrum drug for the organism that you are infected with. So don't use somebody else's. Uh, get your own. Now, hopefully there's a future to, an, uh, to antibiotics uh, because many organisms are rapidly becoming more and more resistant to more and more antibiotics, which means we have got to come up with some alternatives to antimicrobial compounds. And a few that have been thrown around out there are the uh, antimicrobial proteins or peptides. 
These are actually already produced by uh, pigs, frogs, and sharks, and they uh, use these to protect themselves. So that's one thing. Maybe we can start using those. Uh, the problem is they are proteins, and if we start injecting those into people or giving them, there could be a lot of resistance by the body or rejection to it. We could develop uh, or neutralize it with our own antibodies. Our immune system's not real great with it yet. So there's still a lot of research to be done. Then there's the antisense agents, which are um, pieces of genetic material that are complementary to existing RNAs or DNAs. And what these pieces do is attach to the DNA or RNA molecule and prevent it from being uh, replicated. The uh, advantage to antisense agents is we can make them very, very selective about what they attach to. The last is phage therapy. Think about it. We did a whole section on bacteriophages. And what if we could use a bacteriophage to target bacteria in the human body? Because bacteriophages don't attack uh, 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 animal cells. They only attack bacterial cells. So if we can figure out a way to deliver the bacteriophage without our immune system going crazy and trying to neutralize it, then we might be able to start delivering drugs directly or using the phage to destroy bacteria and it would be incredibly selectively toxic and that would be a really good one. All right, I want you guys to maybe think about some other ideas for antimicrobial compounds, some other ways to target these bacteria or um, helminths or another microorganism that causes disease. You need to really understand the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, not just for the upcoming exam, but you're in your pharmacology classes and in your careers in general, you are going to see lots and lots of um, antibiotic resistance. It's a really, really big problem and it is getting worse rapidly. So it is something that um, the medical industry in particular, pharmaceutical companies and doctors and uh, people like yourselves are actually battling against and really working against. So um, I hope you guys have a great day and evening and I will see you all when I get back. All right. Have a good one. Thanks.